Right to be Read podcast, episode number 74, interview with Joe Bunting. Are you struggling trying to figure out how to sell copies of your book, especially the first 100 copies? The Author Marketing Institute is offering access to their latest free video course called Selling the First 100 Copies of Your Book. This is the course everyone should have when they started publishing. It goes through all the basics from starting a mailing list to experimenting with different prices. If you follow the instructions in this course, you should be primed and ready to sell your first 100 copies, if not many more. Sign up for free at www authormarketinginstitute.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to be Right podcast. I'm your host, Tanya Alexander, and with this episode, too, as always, I will try to inspire and encourage you. In case you're listening to this show while you're on your way to work in the morning, I wish you a very pleasant day and a productive one. I hope you're going to enjoy it. And if it's just the opposite and you're coming back from work or from somewhere else, you're getting back home, I wish a very pleasant evening. And today I will be presenting you with the interview, uh, which most probably will help you out with uh, different useful tips and advice we will be getting from my guest. And today my guest is Joe Bunting. He is a writer and entrepreneur. He ghostwrites books for busy leaders and he's also a number one Amazon best-selling writer. And he also publishes the blog for writers, which is called The Right Practice. And he's the founder of the Story Cartel as well. Hello, Joe, and welcome to the Right to be Read podcast. I'm really happy to have you over. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Ani. <laughs> well, I, I've been uh, reading your blog since a long time, and I've read your book also, How to Write Short Story. So, uh, and I've been guest posting on your blog as yeah. well. <laughs> so. Yeah, time I got your email about your guest post and and also kind of seeing your book on Story Cartel High Fall. Which yeah, is great. exactly. So, you know, it, it's not a surprise that I thought of you when I was coming up with potential guests for my show. So we finally made it. And I'm, yeah. really, I'm really happy to have you over. Yeah, um, likewise. So, I mean, since I know you, uh, but my listeners, maybe not all of them know, uh, let's start from the beginning and please tell me, uh, how did you end up becoming a writer? What was your writing journey from the very beginning? Yeah, so like uh, many people, I had a dream of becoming a writer um, from a pretty young age, probably in high school. Um, I would be reading these great books by Charles Dickens and, um, you know, Leo Tolstoy and, and these classic books. And I, you know, around high school age, you sort of start to wonder, like, what, are, what am I going to be when I grow up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, college was coming up. So I was thinking about what I would major in and, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to just sit around and think of stories and kind of live in the stories all the time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the reality is, is that as a writer, um, it's not as easy living in the story as, as a reader. Um, and I didn't, you know, know that at the time. So, uh, you know the the dream that I had um, of being a writer as a you know as a kid was um, I, I didn't know it would be so difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it took me a long a long time to learn that okay so where uh, you you kind of you did your uh, studies later on uh, in creative writing etc so you knew from the very start that that's your choice yeah, so I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to um, study writing. So I, I went to college and I studied English literature mm -hmm. in college. And 
Um, you know, and most English programs at, you know, at college, you don't do much writing, unfortunately. You write a lot about books and you read a lot, um, but there's not a lot of chances to write. So, uh, you know, I spent four years studying writing and, and uh, you know, doing some creative writing, but really mostly what I was doing is studying other writers, which is definitely helpful, but I wasn't doing it very much on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and so I graduated college and uh, got a job. And by this point, newspapers were starting to close down and, and it was a lot more difficult to make a living as a journalist. And so I got a job at a bank and uh -huh. <laughs> was you know, working this desk job. I would, my basic job was I was a professional uh, photocopy maker and coffee maker. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that does not really impact too well the creativity, I guess, huh? No, not very much. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of downtime and I decided to start a blog. And um, I just decided to write every day, you know. Um, whether or not I was getting paid for it, whether or not I was doing it professionally, I wanted to write, and I did, and and I haven't really stopped since. That was about eight or nine years ago. Okay, so was the blog the right practice, or you started with something else? No, it was just a personal blog. I don't I don't think there is any shred of evidence that it ever existed, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you wrote every day, uh, you were blogging, but did you write anything else apart from that, like, you know, any other form of creative writing? Yeah, I mean, mostly it was creative nonfiction, and I would I would uh, kind of post some of my creative nonfiction on the blog and kind of small po piece, poet poems, not really, they were kind of prose poetry. Mm -hmm. Um but nothing too serious. It was mostly just a, kind of a process of reawakening my creative side, um, which had been sort of quiet for a long time. Okay. And uh, what did you do on those days when you didn't really feel like writing? I mean, you committed to write every day and that's what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, not every single day day someone feels like writing so sure. how did you get into writing when you didn't really feel like it yeah I don't remember what I did back then <laughs> but, but, a you long stuck, time ago. but you stuck to your commitment and you did write every day right yeah I mean sometimes it would take a long time and I wouldn't write very much but um, I did try to write something every day mm -hmm. whether it was good or not, whether it was a sentence or three pages. Um, and a lot of times what I would do, I, and this was kind of probably one of the best exercises that I've ever done in my creative writing, I would just kind of observe what was going on around me and I would try to describe um, mm -hmm. whatever captured my eye. Mm -hmm. So I would go to a coffee shop or sit on a bench um, on the street and I would watch people and I would describe them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was such a good lesson in, in showing and not telling, you mm -hmm. know, description and, and even eavesdropping on conversations and, you know, writing out dialogue. Um, it was so valuable for my storytelling, um, that, you know, I still think that, so much of what I do as a writer now kind of has its roots in that description, kind of that note-taking of what was going on around me. Yeah, and I think that also helps with the, you know, creating the real picture and, you know, ending up with the writing which has lots of reality in it and, and yeah. sounds credible. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what happened next? How did you end up helping writers and why did you decide to do so? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I ended up uh, 
you know, getting more involved in my, my writing. I, I worked for a small local magazine, but I didn't have enough time working a day job to really give writing everything I had. So I ended up um, traveling for a year mm -hmm. and went to more than a dozen different countries and got to write the whole time. And it's an amazing kind of year of exploration, um, both of the world and my writing. And then I came home and, and lucked into a job helping a mentor of mine work on their book. And mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of my first full-time writing job, uh, writing his book. And, you know, as that project was wrapping up, um, I started to think about, you know, how much more I wanted to grow in my writing. You know, I'd been writing kind of not quite full time, but very regularly for several years. Um, but I still felt like I, there was so much that I needed to learn about the craft. Um, so that's when I started the right practice. It was in 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to apprentice myself to the craft. And so I, you know, one of the best ways to learn something is to teach. Mm -hmm. and, and so I decided to start teaching writing um, as I was teaching myself. Uh, so, you know, three years later and over a thousand posts, um, you know, now I'm a f little bit further along. <laughs> Still not an expert. I still think of myself as an apprentice, but I'm learning more. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the blog is very popular. It's been acknowledged by many other blogs as uh, one of the best writing blogs and blogs for writers. So apparently, um, with that, you had uh, a massive success. And yeah. where in between those did the book come? Because you, you also wrote and published books, right? Yeah, so, you know, I, I've ghostwritten three other books, um, kind of in the meantime, uh, and we, we published, let's write a short story in 2012. Um, and I think that was, you know, both out of my own desire to learn more about the process of writing short stories and publishing them. Um, and I've published my own short stories online. Um, and, and also kind of, you know, at the time, I think, It was about six months before my first child was born, and I was all stressed about <laughs> <laughs> how was I going to pay for this baby? I'm a writer. I need to support my family. So some of it was kind of out of this uh, you know, nervous desire to provide. So that's part of where that book came from. Okay. You can probably read that book with it and, and sense some desperation in my own uh, tone <laughs> <laughs> well i mean uh i love those kind of books which kind of show the mood and the worries and the excitement of the writer because you know uh when you're uh, reading a non-fiction book you sometimes kind of you know forget that there is a real human being behind it mm -hmm. because it, yeah. sometimes it feels and um, like a dry textbook, let's say, which is, I mean, it, it provides knowledge, but it doesn't really provide any kind of emotional connection with the writer. Sure. So I guess what we had there is, is, is a good sign because, you know, uh, I had the feeling that, you know, <laughs> uh, someone <laughs> wrote that book and, and that someone is a real person and he has the same Yeah. struggles and worries as as i do so i think yeah. that's that's a really nice style which brings into nonfiction because sometimes mm. really nonfiction books are pretty dry and you know yeah unexciting let's say <laughs> so yeah so what happened with that book i mean did you uh i mean you you wrote it with uh certain expectations and hopes mm -hmm. and when it was out what what happened Yeah, I, I um, you know, like I said, I was, I was launching it kind of several months before my first son was born. And, 
you know, in a very real sense, I needed, I needed it to help provide for us. And so I definitely had expectations for how the book would spread, um, whether it would sell, whether it wouldn't, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we kind of went through a process to launch the book, um, that, you know, I hoped would make it successful. And, and the, the main thing I focused on was actually kind of not selling a lot of copies, um, but giving away a lot of copies. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we built a team of about 220 people before we even launched the book that we, that I gave the book away to for free. Um, you know, as, as a hope that they would leave a review and maybe share about the book on social media and on their blogs when it was published. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was kind of an amazing experience. You know, I think as writers, uh, we spend a lot of time working in relative obscurity, mm-hmm. working in, you know, our writer's closet, um, on things that no one gets to see. And, and the amazing part about launching a book is you finally see how people are reacting to your writing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really one of my favorite parts of the writing process itself. You know, when you first start to get feedback, which um, is a bit scary too, right? (laughs) Yeah. It's terrifying. I mean, you're always thinking of the worst things that people people could possibly say. And sometimes they say those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's also, you know, thrilling when people respond and say, this book really helped me. This book inspired me. This book changed my writing, changed my life. Um, and, you know, there's there's kind of that place in between terror and excitement um, that always happens when you launch your writing out into the world. Yeah, and I um, think it doesn't really matter whether it's a nonfiction or fiction book because I no. had exactly the same feelings. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, some, one of my biggest pieces of advice to people is, is just to start writing, um, whether it's, you know, you're publishing a book or you're publishing a blog post or you're sending a short story to a a close group of friends. Um, There's so much value in getting feedback from other people, um, good or bad. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And how do you deal with, uh, I mean, when we talk about feedback uh, how do you deal with the harsh feedback do you I mean um, do you perceive it as something you have to look to and try to uh, you know make your writings better based on that feedback or uh, I mean how much role does the feedback have into modifying your writing and creating Mm -hmm. a final copy let's say yeah That's a good question. I mean, the first thing that I try to do when I get feedback is to say thank you, Um, whether it's directly or just kind of internally, because they didn't have to read your book or your piece of writing. Um, You know, they took time out of their lives to read, and that's a gift, Um, even if they didn't have a positive reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and then, you know, I asked the question, you know, is this about me and my writing or is it about them? Um, and maybe it's about both, you know, maybe it's about them. Maybe they, it's just not the right book for them. Uh, or maybe it's something I can fix. And maybe it's something I can't fix, but it is, it's still about me. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes you just have to accept that. But, you know, for me, I think... Part of the keys is just to get a wide enough sample of readers so that you can start to distinguish whether it's just them 
or whether it's you. You know, if you send your writing piece to three people and one of them doesn't like it, um, it's pretty easy to come to the conclusion that it's about you, you mm -hmm. know. But if you send it to a hundred people and one person doesn't like it, uh, then, you know, you don't have to take it so personally. Now, if half of them don't like it, that's another question. But, um, yeah, I think you have to find your audience and you have to kind of cast a wide enough net um, where you, you start to see, you know, you have to have a good sample size, to use a science term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, in, in the right practice in the blog, you help writers evolve and grow as writers and you kind of you practice different exercises which make mm -hmm. your writing better, etc, etc. So um, what are the biggest struggles that your blog readers have? And what kind of feedback do you receive? What are you are they need to have uh, most help with? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing that people struggle with uh, is probably something I can't help them with, which is kind of discouraging to me and to them, I'm sure. Um, but it's just the ability to finish something. Oh, the, okay. The ability to finish your writing. I'm, a lot of people will, you know, email me and say, I have all these great ideas for stories, um, but you know, when I sit down to write, I write a paragraph or a page, uh, but I can't finish, you know. I come back the next day and, and I can't write at all or I just forget about it altogether. Um, so how do, I, how do I write a book if I can't <laughs> yeah. finish? And, and why, why is that, do you think? What, what's the reason? Uh, I think people think that an idea is all it takes to write a good book. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, George R. R. Martin had a great interview with Rolling Stone where he said, ideas are worthless. Execution is everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've all had really good ideas. We're writers, we're smart, creative people. Um, we've all had really good ideas, but it takes discipline to, uh, to write a book, you know, and there's no getting around it. Mm -hmm. um, it takes, it takes a thousand decisions to get up in the morning and write, um, to, you know, s turn off the television and write to decide to write. Yeah, well, and it's, and it's not always an easy decision. And it's a shame because I mean, when you are going to uh, work every morning, and this work is not necessarily the yeah. best one or the one you really love, you never double, uh, you know, double doubt about whether you should do that or not. You just know you have to and you wake up and you go to that work. But when it's uh, about writing, you kind of, you know, consider it as a choice and, you know, okay, I feel like it or I don't feel like it. And you, I always have other options to, to follow, which is kind of, I don't know. I mean, I have a feeling that if you want to become a professional writer, then you should consider it as a work, as like, you yeah. know, not having an, another option, but you know, waking up and writing or writing whenever you, you usually write, but, you know, making sure you, you put in some words every single day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what we've tried to do with the right practice is just to make it really simple with people, for people. Um, we only ask for 15 minutes a day and, you know, we'll teach you something about writing and we'll ask you to participate, to give it a try. Um, and, you know, we've had thousands of writers practice with us. Um, a lot of them practice every day. Uh, so that's been encouraging. It's been encouraging to be a part of a community, um, that, that wants to grow at the craft, um, and is willing to put in the hours and the discipline to make it happen. 
Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you mentioned a very important word, and that's community, because I think that many writers feel very lonely in their process of writing, and some uh, don't yet have the courage to share it with, with the broader audience. So having yeah. a smaller community where they could feel kind of, you know, comfortable and safe might help them in their uh, starting stage. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And what about uh, people who are starting writing their first books? Uh, what do you advise them? What do you teach them in terms of the writing processes? You know, because uh, for, for someone who's just starting writing, I mean, writing a mm -hmm. poem or writing a very short story or flash fiction, it's a bit easy because it's not so complex. It doesn't require such a long period of time. And, you know, many newbie writers kind of manage that relatively easier than, for example, mm -hmm. novelists, let's say, where mm -hmm. you have a much longer process and more complicated structure, etc. Yeah. So what do you advise those who kind of decide to come up with something more complex? Mm. Yeah, I think the most important thing you can do is is to give yourself deadlines and to break up your project into smaller chunks, whether it's chapters or sections. Um, you know, I work and mentor students who are writing books. And, you know, every week they have to turn in a chapter, a chapter of their book. So three to 5,000 words per week. Um, for some people, that's a lot of writing. Uh, for some of these, you know, people writing the book, uh, this is their first time writing that much. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's so important to have a deadline that keeps you focused, uh, that induces a little bit of stress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, not all of us really enjoy feeling stress, but stress actually is. Uh, in the right amount is a good thing. Um, it focuses you, it creates motivation. Um, and, you know, I think we all need a little bit of stress to write well. Not too much stress, but a little bit. Um, and so a good deadline can do that. And, and, you know, the hard part is setting a deadline yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you set your own deadline... Uh, depending on the relationship that you have with yourself, you might not be willing to keep it um, two or three weeks from now or a month from now when the writing is really difficult. Uh, so, you know, one thing that I encourage people to do is to, uh, you know, find some kind of accountability for your deadline. So whether that means getting a group of friends who are writers, um, to together set a deadline with you uh, or joining a writer's club or even just kind of asking your friends and family, hey, this is something I'm passionate about. Will you help me keep this deadline? Mm -hmm. uh, will you keep me accountable? Um, and, and sometimes that's just a good way to create a little bit of extra, I don't know, Fear isn't the right word, um, but something like fear, you know. Responsibility. So that if you, <laughs> yeah, responsibility. You know, if you don't finish this chapter, you need to have some kind of consequence, whether you're letting yourself down or a community down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, what helped me personally in that respect was NaNoWriMo, because, you mm. know, uh, it, it, for me, it was like one of the most effective accountability tools. Mm -hmm. When I, uh, well, first of all, I had this feeling that I'm not alone. There are many people who yeah. are doing it right now. And second, you know, when you're looking at the chart with the word count and you see, you know, when you will finish the book and how mm -hmm. much is left and, you know, uh, that you are behind or you're, you're on track, etc. It right. kind of helped me along the way. Yeah, that is good. I think NaNoWriMo has definitely been a huge uh, way that a lot of people have gotten involved, gotten disciplined about writing. Um, 
And I, I actually, you know, some people kind of scoff at the idea of writing a book in a month. Um, but I think you do better when you write a first draft in a short amount of time. Stephen King said, uh, a first draft should always be w- written in a season, never longer than a season. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like three months? Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think... Sometimes we get too perfectionistic about our first drafts, especially. So, and um, also I would like to uh, cover a bit. I mean, I want you to tell a bit about Story Cartel because I'm sure that there are many writers mm-hmm. who and who finally finish what they have written and and have uh, the books out there, but they don't, re- since they don't yet have the audience and they don't have many people mm-hmm. who had the time to read and provide feedback and reviews, um, yeah. they really don't know where to go for the reviews. And I mean, there are places like Goodreads, which help a lot with that. There are places like, you know, I don't mm-hmm. know, different social network groups, etc. But uh, many might not really feel comfortable approaching people they don't know, which I mean, that, that approach is not like for everyone. So mm-hmm. um, tell us what you created to help those people and what, what it does in terms of getting reviews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we started it. We started Story Cartel in 2012, and our main goal was just to create something that would help authors uh, market their books, however was most effective. Um, and what we learned as we were kind of exploring the process of marketing your book, especially online, is that you know the best way and kind of the first way to market your book is to get reviews and specifically Amazon reviews found that Amazon reviews kind of do three things. Um, They, first of all, they provide social proof. So we're all more likely to read a book that has a hundred reviews than a book that has five reviews. Let's mm-hmm. say, yeah, yeah. We want to. We all want to read books that our friends are reading, um, and so kind of the, having that social proof of reviews is really helpful. It's kind of like, you know, Facebook likes. Yeah, um, we pay more attention to a post that has a thousand likes than three. You know. Mm. Yeah. So the second thing it does uh, is it, in in a lot of ways, creates word of mouth buzz. So when publishers are trying to market books, one of the main things that they focus on is word of mouth buzz. Word of mouth buzz sells books. Mm -hmm. Um, We're likely to buy the books that our friends are talking about. And, uh, and reviews can help create that. Um, You know, you're more likely to talk about a book that you've reviewed uh, than a book that you haven't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And kind of the third thing that reviews um, helped with, we discovered, was Amazon's own algorithm. Um, We found that books that had more reviews climbed sales ranks faster than books with less. And so Amazon's always changing their algorithm. So that might be true today, but not true tomorrow. But that's kind of what we discovered about reviews. Mm -hmm. Um, And... You know, so that we found that that was kind of the first step. Getting reviews was the first step that an author had to do to market their book. Um, and so we developed a process, um, and it was a process that we had had used on some of our own books. Um, I used it on Let's Write a Short Story, and you know, in the first week, I think we had over. 60 reviews and now it has almost 200 um so it it worked and uh and since then since 2012 we've helped launch you know maybe 1500 books um and gotten thousands of amazon reviews for authors um so it's it's definitely working Mm mm-hmm 
And do you um, do you choose the books? I mean, anyone can have their books there enrolled there, mm -hmm. or you you choose and make sure that they, uh, you know, they answer to certain requirements. Yeah, it's a good question. So we think of Story Cartel kind of like a Kickstarter for reviews. It's a way to crowdsource reviews. Um, so we do have guidelines and we, we won't take any book. Um, you know, a book has to first be formatted correctly, um, has to look like a real book online. And, uh, and then, you know, we have certain requirements about um, sexually explicit mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. So, um, but past that, we don't have, we don't curate, uh, you know, kind of like Amazon, kind of like Kickstarter. Um, we kind of let the crowd curate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, part of crowdsourcing is that, uh, you know, the, the author or the Kickstarter project creator has to bring their crowd. They have to bring whatever crowd they have um, to the party, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we definitely help as much as we can to, uh, to get the word out about their books as well. Um, and yeah, we've, we've uh, found that, you know, if you can get people the book in their hands, um, they'll read it and they'll leave a review and, and those reviews uh, will help drive sales. Yeah, and I would also like to mention that when you are doing books promotions, uh, many book promotion sites require a minimum number of reviews right. that the book has. So, you know, it helps with that as well. Yeah. Okay, so if we try to wrap everything up, let's say just have a one like big umbrella uh, advice to newbie writers who are just starting their first steps towards uh, the exciting journey of becoming authors. Uh, hmm. What would you advise or, you know, I don't know, the, the most important few things that they should do from the very beginning? Uh, what would you advise them? Where should they start and how they should proceed? Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Um, I think the first thing I would say is is to publish. You know, most people would probably start with something like just start writing. Um, but if you want to be a writer, you've probably written something. It might not be a novel. It might not be a full short story, but it it's something. And I think... Until you start acknowledging uh, your your writing in public, as soon as if you don't start putting it out into the world, um, it's very difficult to step into your identity as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, too many people keep their work locked away in private for too long, and it really can sap your motivation. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I tell people publish, put your writing out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it doesn't have to be a finished novel. Uh, it could be a short story. It could be uh, a blog post. Um, but the act of putting your work in public, the act of publishing will do more to make you feel like a writer than almost anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's very sad to see people who have even finished novels, but they're still keeping it to themselves. So sure. it's like so much time and effort left to that book. And then, you know, no one sees that. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's very sad. I, I know it takes a lot of courage and it's it's very scary. And, you know, it's um, it requires a certain emotional state to get mm. into before that, uh, before you are ready to publish. But uh, I agree with you that nothing will happen unless you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you don't have to 
set the stakes really high. You don't have to publish your novel for the first time. Just kind of getting into the practice of publishing something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and publishing could be as small as printing out, you know, a page of your writing and giving it to a friend and asking for their feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't need to be something elaborate. Yeah. Um, but writers write for people. They don't write in closets. If you want to be a professional writer, you're going to be someone who writes in public. Um, and it's important to start getting practice at that, getting in the practice of receiving feedback, receiving criticism. Um, it's important to start learning what it takes to make people interested in what you're writing. Um, you know, because sometimes the the words that you write for yourself uh, are not very interesting to other people. Uh, so it's important to start figuring out how to uh, how to entertain and inform, inspire others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming over and spending all this time with us. I really appreciate your, um, you know, sharing the knowledge and and um, telling us what you think about different issues. It was really t- nice talking to you and uh, I wish you success with all the upcoming uh, things you will be doing. Yeah, thank you so much, Ani, and thank you for everything that you're doing Uh, to inspire writers I, th- i think what you're doing is awesome <laughs> thank you thanks well it seems like that's it for today i really really appreciate every single one of you i would like to thank you once again for listening to this show and if you think that you've got a minute to spare for me please make sure that you leave a review for the podcast on iTunes or on Stitcher uh, in order to help me grow the podcast so it reaches more people and inspires and encourages them as well. Thanks a lot and I'll meet you in the next week. Take care. Bye. Are you struggling trying to figure out how to sell copies of your book, especially the first 100 copies? The Author Marketing Institute is offering access to their latest free video course called Selling the First 100 Copies of Your Book. This is the course everyone should have when they started publishing. It goes through all the basics from starting a mailing list to experimenting with different prices. If you follow the instructions in this course, you should be primed and ready to sell your first 100 copies, if not many more. Sign up for free at www.authormarketinginstitute.com.